All right, I'm going to talk about systems risk. So we have talked a lot this week about evaluating single structures, single dams, single levees, and what that looks like. But what about when we have systems? Because dams and, and levees rarely operate on an individual basis, right? So our objectives here, we're going to describe the types of systems that are related to dams and levees, including scenarios and some potential failure modes, understand how we approach evaluating system risks or risks for systems of structures, and then explain potential complex system risks when individual structures may vary in ownership. So a little background, there's uh, several different things to consider for system risk. We have river systems, so we can have hazards such as earthquakes or large aerial rainfall events. Uh, these events can affect more than one structure at a time. Right? We're talking about very, very large regional storm events or, or large earthquake events such as a Cascadia event. It's very unlikely that only one structure is going to feel those hazards. And these failures, failures of structures, can have cascading effects downstream. Uh, the risk felt by an affected population isn't just based on one structure. It may be based on several structures. And then we can have large protected areas, or we'll call them polders. I'm not 100% sure where that name came from. Kind of fun to say, polders. Can be at risk of simultaneous failure. So you can have breaches that happen at multiple locations along a long levee system, for example. Uh, and in these scenarios, mutual, mutual exclusivity and independence don't apply. So what are some types of systems and approaches that we have for system risk? So we can have generally three general types of systems, like I said before, multiple structures that impact single population centers. So these would be structures that are in series along uh, a single river, or we could even have structures in parallel along several river basins. We can have long structures that overtop or fail simultaneously at multiple points, like I said, a long levee system, or multiple breach locations that affect multiple population centers. So this slide is basically a repeat of the slide I just talked about. But emphasis, repetition for emphasis, end of the week, right? So here's an example of a, a levee system. This is Natomas Levee in the Sacramento area. So this is, this is what I'm talking about. We have a, a population center down here. Where's my pointer? Down in this region. But you can see it's surrounded by all of these levee systems. Now the, pr prim the primary land type that this levee system is protecting is agricultural, right? But a breach of any one of these levee structures is going to result in flooding of this population down here by the A2 and I reaches. Now if reach C breaches, this population is going to get flooded. If reach E breaches, this population is going to get flooded. So you can't just look at this system as individual parts. You have to look at the system as part of a whole. Here's an example of uh, some dams in series. So this is uh, Omaha, Nebraska, right down here. This is the, I believe it's the Missouri River. Yeah, Missouri River. And along this system, we have uh, many different dams. You can see all the different structures here. But down here in Omaha, um, you have to ask yourself, what, what risk does the population in Omaha feel? Does it feel the risk from just one structure immediately upstream of it? Does it feel the risk from this whole series of structures? So it feels the risk from a whole series of structures. Now here's an example of a system in parallel. This is the Willamette Valley out in the Pacific Northwest. So you can see we have all these different dams, Big Cliff, Detroit, Green Peter, Foster, Blue River, Cougar that are on all these different river systems, but they all lead to Salem, Oregon. So this uh, inundation map here shows what the effects of breaches of these structures would be. So then we ask ourselves, what risk does Salem feel? So this document here is a good example of how to approach system risk. This document was written regarding our systems risk, risk approach to the Willamette Valley, RMC technical report. 2019-04, and I believe this document is on the RMC website if you would like to download and read it. But uh, we're going to talk through in the next few slides a little bit about how this document lays out our approach to system risk. So here's a, a map of the Willamette Valley again. The first step of a system risk approach is that we define the system. Defining the system is important. 
All right, so the figure on the left shows all the structures and all the rivers that are in the Willamette Valley. So we have to define this, where the structures are and their relative location in the valley. And then the figure in the middle shows the hydrologic basins in the valley. And then finally, the figure on the right shows a schematic of how all of the systems, all the structures, all the dams in the valley are uh, where they're located and how they relate to the system as a whole. So we have all the, all the structures, and then we also list out which um, population centers they affect. Here's a list of all the structures in the Willamette Valley. So we have a lot, right? We have however many dams that is. We have a lot of levees as well. So you can imagine when we start talking about different combinations and failure scenarios, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a few slides, but there's a lot of different combinations, a lot of different variables and structures that we have to consider. And you can kind of think of this as a, a system or a sub-portfolio of the greater USACE portfolio, right? So we manage the USACE portfolio as a whole nationwide, but then this system of dams and levees kind of operates as its own subsystem within the larger USACE system. And the risk within a system like this is, is really, it's highly correlated. So the system risk is going to be higher than the risk of any single structure. And what I mean by that, what I mean by the system is correlated is a, a failure of, of one structure makes the failure of another structure more likely, right? Because we're introducing all of this breach outflow into the system, when that hits a structure downstream of it, it's going to affect the, the performance of that system as well. Another way that they're correlated is when we're in a, a, the same region, like I said before, those large storm events are not just going to affect one dam or levy in the system, they're going to affect several. Here we go. So the overall approach to systems risk is, is pretty straightforward, but like I said before, some of the math can get complicated. So first off, like we saw a couple of slides ago, we define the system. Now we need to, find, need to define the scenarios. So one of these scenarios is shown on the bottom right of uh, the slide, or the right-hand side of the slide. So this is an example for two dams, Green Peter and Foster. So Green Peter is located about eight miles upstream of Foster. So when you think about the scenario, the different failure scenarios that these two dams uh, present, you can split that into a tree format like this. So the first step in the tree is whether Green Peter fails or does not fail. Well, whether it fails or doesn't fail, you then need to evaluate whether Foster fails or does not fail. So this leads to three separate failure scenarios. You can either have a failure of both, you can have Green Peter fail and Foster not fail, or you can have Green Peter not fail and Foster fail. And then of course there's the final branch, which is neither of them fail. So that's three scenarios for two dams. Think of all the structures that we saw on the last slide. How complicated do you think it's going to get trying to define all the failure scenarios for all of the projects in the valley? It's going to get really complicated really quickly, right? So once we identify the system, define the system and identify the scenarios, we have to quantify the probabilities for each one of these scenarios. And then finally, we need to account for the conditions or analyses that are correlated. So we do this by using models of stochastic independence. This is where you really need to lean on the expertise of, of specialized team members to help you out with some of these intricate analyses. And then finally, at the, at the end of the day, we have to calculate or quantify the consequences due to failure. So a lot of times, you know, we evaluate consequences from a single dam or levee breach. That's relatively straightforward. Well, what happens when we start adding more dams, when we start adding more area, when we start adding more water to the system? Talk about all these scenarios being individual. How much modeling is that going to take? It's going to take a lot of modeling. It's going to be a big effort to quantify all of that. Let's talk a little bit about ownership and responsibilities. So I'm a core dam and I fail. Well, what happens if the closest dam downstream to me is owned by the Bureau, is owned by FERC, is owned by the state of South Carolina? How do I evaluate the consequences of my dam's breach on that structure? 
The simple answer, at least amongst the core, the Bureau, TVA, and FERC, is that we don't. What we do is we make simplifying assumptions. As of right now, we assume that any dam that is not owned and operated by us, us being whichever entity is doing the risk evaluation, operates as intended. So if I'm a core dam and I breach, when I get to the USBR dam downstream, that dam is going to pass the flow without failing. So you can imagine that can be a pretty big simplifying assumption if that downstream dam, say, overtops by 10 feet. But that's the way we've set it up between the, the four core agencies. That's how we're doing things right now. We haven't really gotten to the, the point in our development where we're, we're having cross-agency system risk evaluations. All right, so individual structures versus systems. Let's talk a little bit about how we calculate the risks for each one. So for individual structures, like we've been talking about, we have multiple potential failure modes. Each one of those potential failure modes has an annual probability of failure, average annual life loss, and we combine those together to arrive at a, a total project risk, like Damon just talked about. If those PFMs are assumed to be mutually exclusive, we simply sum them together. If they're not mutually exclusive, then we combine them using some of the methods that we just went over. We might use a common cause adjustment. We might do something else to combine them that's appropriate for the, the relationship between those potential failure modes. Now, for a system, we have to consider it a little bit differently. So think about that two dam scenario we've been talking about. Considered individually, that pair has two different failure outcomes. Dam A fails and dam B fails. If you consider them together as a system, you have those two scenarios, but you also have a third scenario, and that's that they both fail. But what if the failure of both structures isn't mutually exclusive from the failure of either structure individually? You can't just take the, the consequences or the failure probability of both at the same time and add it to each individual failure to get it a system total. So you can see in this Venn diagram here on the bottom right-hand corner, there might be a lot of overlap between those. So you could have A not B, B not A, and A and B, but there's a lot of overlap in there. So simply adding them together is going to result in an overestimation of the system risk. So we, we can't really do that. So we have to figure out how to, to properly combine everything. All right, so let's talk about alternatives. So as of right now, system risk is not part of any agency's tolerable risk guidelines. We don't manage our portfolios based on system risk. We manage them based on an individual risk. However, knowing the system risk is important to us in other ways. Particularly, it's useful in the area of assessing risk reduction alternatives. It allows us to develop more cost-effective alternatives, cost-effective solutions to reduce the overall risk felt by a population um, by considering the other structures in the system. And remember that ultimate goal, when we reduce risk for a structure, yes, we want that structure's risk to be tolerable, but we also want to consider that a, a certain population feels the risk from multiple structures at once. So it's, it's really our goal to reduce the risk for that population as much as we can. So we're back to our two dam system here. We got two embankment dams. Dam A is upstream and dam B is downstream. Here's some particulars on the embankments. You don't need to memorize all this. Takeaway here is that dam A is a lot bigger than dam B. Dam A has a reservoir size of a million acre feet. Dam B is 45,000 acre feet. Dam A has a height of 200 feet. Dam B has a max height of 90 feet. So a baseline risk assessment for these two structures indicates that we have overtopping concerns at each of them. So we run through a risk assessment and we quantify the risk due to overtopping at each of, our, each of those structures and we come out with these failure probabilities. For the, for the system as a total, we have 6.87 e to the minus five is our annual probability of failure. And you can see for the system, our average annual life loss plots above our 1E minus 3 societal guideline. So our outcome from our risk assessments is that we need to 
do something to reduce the risks in the system. Right, well, how do we go about figuring out how we're going to do that? We look at the systems approach. So there's three system structural modifications that we're considering. We can modify dam B, modify dam B only. We can modify dam A only. Or we can modify dam A, but also introduce a change in the way that dam A is operated to affect the risk at dam B. So you can see that each of those modifications has a cost. Modifying dam B is 45 million, dam A is 28 million, and then modifying dam A and changing the system operations is 30 million. So here's the results of, of that risk assessment with those alternatives. Here's our existing risk. So we, so we plot above that 1E minus 3 societal guideline. This option here is modifying dam A only. So remember that was 40, uh, $28 million. Down here, we can modify dam B only. So this is a cost of $28 million. Well, if we modify dam A and B, our risk is lower than either of the other individual alternatives. And it only costs $2 million more than modifying dam B by itself. So although we're spending a little bit more, and we may not be affecting the risk of dam A as dramatically as we would be if we modified dam A uh, with the $28 million alternative, uh, and the same thing for, for dam B, even if we don't achieve the same level of risk reduction from the more expensive alternative of modifying dam A and implementing an operational change, our system risk is reduced most effectively by this alternative. So that's just one example of the way that we can consider system risks in how we try to modify our structures to reduce risk for population centers. So some takeaways for system risk. System risk isn't part of any agency's guidelines right now. Uh, but knowing the system risk is useful for those structural modification alternatives that we just talked about. It's the biggest takeaway from this presentation. It's useful during modification studies, uh, and the approach is relatively simple when you have smaller systems, but it gets very complicated very quickly when you start adding more structures into the mix. Does the... Uh... You know, when you're looking at the when you're looking at how these structures fail, you've presumably looked at them all individually, done your mapping and so forth. But now you've got a system. Uh, it, do you look at different sort of failure mechanisms for each individual structure? Yeah, and adjust it that way. Yeah. So the the breach modeling, life sim modeling, it, it will be failure mode specific, right? Because like we've been talking about all week, that plays a huge role in, the, in potential consequences, whether you have a slow developing failure, a brittle failure. So yes, it would be failure mode specific. Hey, Adam, um, I know that we don't account for that in our risk, but say we, a failure actually does happen. Do we get, like you say, has a dam upstream of bureaus, you know, who actually owns the consequences? Sure. That's a, a, That's a great hard, yeah. question. Yeah. And I fortunately, think. I don't think it's an, a question that we've had to answer with a real world application to date. Not yet. But yep. um, the, the general thought is that it, that's, it's hard to answer. I, I can say that I don't know. The <laughs> figure it out. Yes, Lord, yeah. figure it out. Teams of them, I'm sure. When you're costing out, like in your example for modified dam A and mod in the operational change, if your operational change, would you do like a life cycle cost for that operational change, or would it just be the, or is that just kind of not factored into that cost? That might be a little outside the example. Sure. So when we when we look at potential modifications, such as like when we do a mod study, we look at a 50-year period of analysis. So when we, we put together the, the total cost and, and benefits of each alternative, it's spread out over a 50-year period. And we do the same thing with our, our risk, the risk piece of it. We have a future without action condition. So we're evaluating the risks as if they're 50 years out of the future. So trying to make sure that we're we're capturing that 
period of analysis. Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, you guys don't really look at cross agency system risk, like you said. Do you guys share information and data? For instance, if you had, an, um, I don't know, a bureau dam upstream of one of yours, will you gather that information and then assess your structure so you understand what's going to happen? Should that, I don't know, overtop, have a huge spill event, fail, any of those things? I don't think so. I don't think we we would. Okay. I don't think. I think that's true, but I think we would under try to understand if there's a structure upstream, how they're going to operate that, because that would feed into what our inflows would be. I don't know, Carolyn, maybe if... She well, uh, yes, I, I think that would be something that we would take into, into account, account when we're developing our hydrologic hazard analysis because those are regulated flows right. coming from uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't develop any of those analyses based on any kind of failure breach or failure but outflows from upstream projects into regulated systems we would capture and we would assume they would operate according to those regulation schedules just kind of jumping off of that so you've got dam a upstream and that's some other agency you got dam b downstream while well, one is looking at their system saying, because you said they are, you, the assumption is everything operates according to plan. So you're going to assume if you breach, downstream dam can take that. Downstream dam is looking at their system or their development and saying upstream dam is not going to breach. So there's this big gap there that's not being looked at, right? Sure. Is that you, my seen it right? <laughs> effectively, yes. You're, you're poking holes in our system right now, which is good. They that, exist. Yeah. That's uh, that's again, it's a simplifying assumption that we make in order to operate our portfolios on an independent basis. I just want to add on to that a little bit. So we often, I mean, this situation comes up all the time, um, and. Some of the ways that I've seen it, or an example of the way I've seen it handled is we call the folks that are at the dam downstream and say, hey, we just did our update for our modeling. It appears that we're going to see about this much overtopping of your dam, FYI. And so um, in this particular example that I'm thinking of, we um, did that communication process and the downstream dam um, modified their dam to allow it to overtop um, safely. And so those are those are conversations that we do have when we find that those are <laughs> implications from a modeling. And if we were to find out, let's say theoretically, a bureau dam upstream called us with that kind of information, what we would do is we would take that, synthesize it, develop a, a new stage frequency curve, a new, you know, updated H and H analysis, and we would take a look at that structure via risk assessment again to see how the risks have changed based on that updated information. And then from there we'd make a decision if anything else needed to happen. I'd say within TVA we attribute risk in the upstream direction. So if we've got a dam that's that's downstream and there was a there was an issue with the upstream dam that could cause a problem, that, that gets attributed to the uh, to the upstream dam when we do the when we do the risk analyses. The other, so you're, you're saying you consider cascading effects? Not specifically, but if we if we were to if we were looking at the downstream dam, and we said, okay, if there's a if there's if there's a, I guess it's it's a long, it's a convoluted way of saying no. We don't right now consider um, cascading effects. And this is a special case, but uh, Kentucky and Barkley are hydraulically connected, but they're not. If if Kentucky were to uh, were to fail, it end up in the Ohio. It wouldn't end up at Barkley. Uh, another interesting thing with TVA and, and the core is we utilize core cadres a number of times, so you guys get some insights into what our dams look like. Although you don't really have a direct impact down downstream other than what could possibly go through that navigation canal. Right. 